thank you for choosing to worship with us today here at First Memorial. We're glad to have you with us. We turn now to our, oh, before I do that, um, in Rachel's absence for a long overdue day off, we are blessed with Loretta and her talents. Thank you for being with us today. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Who are God, whose love is sure. Because of such great mercy, God is ready to forgive all the ways we fail to live in faithfulness. Relying on that mercy, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Trusting you does not always come easy, O oh God, when each day we are faced with the ugliness of the world. We find it hard to believe that love conquers fear. We are not convinced that power comes through weakness. We cannot conceive how you could heal us. Forgive our lack of faith, O oh God, and renew our trust in you for we would be disciples of Jesus, in whose name we pray. If the Lord kept count of all our sins, who could stand? But with God there is forgiveness. Christ gives us peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. On the night of his arrest, in the midst of the upper room, Jesus told his disciples, I'll give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Oh. Today, <clears throat> sorry, today, as we make a good faith effort to say what we believe, we turn to the simple words first taught to new believers generations ago, probably in the fifth century, which we know today as the Apostles' Creed. Let us use them in our minds, at least, as we think about what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
The peace of Christ be with you all. Remembering that, remember also that Jesus has filled us with the Spirit, which enables us to live lives that show forth fruit as evidence of God's love for the world. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And now please pray silently with me as I say, Almighty God, in Jesus Christ you show us the breadth of your power and the depth of your love. You listen to our cries of pain and hear our laments. You see the fear in our eyes and know the secrets of our hearts. You do not turn from our distress, but stretch out your hand to heal, to comfort, and to save. All thanks and praise be to you, O God. Your steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Good morning, kiddos out there. All right, so children's lesson today. Now I have a flashlight here, you can all see. If I take it apart, can you guys see what I have here? I have batteries, right? Now, if I just hold the batteries in my hand, can I feel any power coming out of them? No, right? There's nothing, it's just batteries. So, let's put them back in. Hopefully I do it right. Okay, now, in today's scripture lesson, we're gonna learn about a woman who needed healing. So, Jesus was in a big crowd, and the woman went up to him and touched him. She made a connection with him, okay? And you know what happened? She was healed. So, just by herself, she couldn't heal herself. And Jesus by himself, he couldn't heal her. They needed to make that connection. So, let's see if we made the right connection. Can you guys see? There's metal pieces inside that need to connect to the batteries. And by itself, the flashlight is nothing. By themselves, the batteries are nothing. When they make that connection, that is when we get the flashlight to turn on. But there's one more little piece that we need in there. Because by himself, Jesus isn't nothing, right? He's everything. But we have to have trust. So that, those metal pieces, that's the trust and the belief we have in Jesus. So we have our batteries, we have our flashlight, and then we have that trust, that connection. And that is how we turn the flashlight on, and that is how the woman was healed, because she trusted Jesus would heal her, and he did. So let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to trust in you and, have, and healing us because we trust in you. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. By the power of your spirit, speak your word to us, O God. Show us who you are and who you are calling us to be. For the sake of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Today's scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter five, verses 21 through 43. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, came and, when he saw Jesus, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. 
She had endured much under, these, under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, but if I touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And the disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can, how can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they had said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make such a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He, told, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha come, which means little girl, wake up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. And this, this they were over, at this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Rachel. A touch of faith. A mere touch. We're looking especially, but not exclusively, at Mark chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, where the woman had heard about Jesus and came behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, but if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. If I but touch his clothes. Today we find Jesus working two extreme healing miracles, seemingly more profound than, to me at least, than having your eyesight returned or your hearing restored or your ability to walk, unless of course you're suffering from one of those ailments, in which case nothing would be more profound than that. But when you think about what's involved with this woman and with this child, Interestingly, the child is 12 years old and the woman has been in this condition for 12 years. What could that mean? The woman was either from a wealthy family or a widow with unusual means. But she had spent her resources, all the money she had over those many years, trying to heal this ongoing flow of blood, otherwise known as an unending menses, or put in modern terms, the flow of blood never ceased. Her formal financial resources are implied by the fact that she spent money on physicians in search of a healing. Ordinary folk didn't have that luxury. They didn't go to the doctor. They didn't take their children to the doctor. They didn't take their children to an emergency room, of course, mostly because there wasn't one. But frankly, professional healing was not available unless you had a lot of money. And she must have had some money to start out with. But as time unfolded and she got worse, the money just went 
and the healing did not occur. Now, she's an outcast. She is unclean. When women in this day and culture were going through her cycle of life, when the flow of blood stopped, she would go to a mikvah, which is a little room near the temple, and there she would be ceremoniously watched and blessed and declared clean to be with other people. Because up until that happens, she stays at home alone and does not allow her husband to touch her. An outcast is a pretty tough thing to endure for 12 years. People crossing the street not to see you or be near you, not to hear your words if you're asking for money, and she must have asked for something. She must have begged for food because it's clear her resources had been completely depleted. She was alienated, alone, and diseased. It's hard to imagine, or it was hard for her to imagine, that life could be any worse than that. But how she got to touch Jesus is sort of a miracle in and of itself. The disciples, who were untrained and an unarmed cadre of secret service men, would have surrounded Jesus with a primitive screen of protection. I don't know if they used the diamond formation the way they do around the President of the United States, but he would have, she would have been, I'm sorry, Jesus would have been protected on all sides. And yet the crowd was so dense, the implication is that they were reaching through and around each other like he was a rock star trying to get a piece of them. The woman strategized and got down on her hands and knees right behind the disciples. And as the moment arrived when Jesus stepped within an arm's reach, she touched the hem of his garment. She touched his cloak. And immediately, she felt a surge of good feeling come over her. And she knew in that instant that she had been healed. But in that same instant, Jesus also felt that flow of power leave him and go somewhere. And because of it being divine, he wanted to know who got it, who caught it, who made that connection. And the answer to that was confessed by the woman who stood up and said, it was me, mea culpa, I did it. Instead of being mad, like the disciples were getting, of course they were getting impatient with Jesus too. What do you mean somebody touched you? Everybody's trying to touch you. We can't hoard them all off, hold them all off. But Jesus wouldn't give up. He persisted in questioning who touched me until she confessed that it was her. And this amazing moment occurs when Jesus gives her a blessing in response to her reaching out. In the moment who touched me was transformed to daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Daughter, no one else that Jesus healed whether it was eyes or hearing or any other disease, any other problem, disability. He doesn't call them by a family relation name. He doesn't designate them as son or daughter or father or mother. But this woman, this woman who reached out and touched him, he refers to as daughter we think to signify the fact that he was now including her in his spiritual family. Where she had been included in no one's 
relationship, he now pronounces her worthy to be in his relationship, in, in relationship with him. That was the utmost in peace. For now she would be able to be mikvahed, now she would be able to talk to people, and as they found out and the word spread, more and more people would reach out to her, perhaps remembering who she was in her past, her pre-disease situation. Now remember, this happened on the road where Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house. And Jairus is no slouch. He's the leader of the temple. He's the most important, outside of the priest, most important uh, religious person in the community. His presence implied acceptance. His words implied wisdom. His caring implied a blessing. So back to plan A, like when he had started out, he continues on the road to get to Jairus' house. And on the way, a group of people come from the house thinking they're doing a good thing and sparing Jesus. They pronounced that the little girl had died and that there was no reason for him to continue his journey. He waved them off and he continued. And as he approached the house, there were people inside the house and outside the house who were doing that wailing thing that is common in many cultures of the world, that crying out loud in this desperate agony. And Jesus says, hush, cut that out. The little girl's not dead, she's just sleeping. And they went from extreme grief to extreme relief, saying, ha, huh, what are you saying? It's ridiculous. She's dead. Jesus ignored them. And as he went into the house through the rest of the people, not part of the family, out into the front yard with the people who were crying. And he took his three disciples who were traveling closest to him in there, in the little girl's room, and the mother and the father, and he spoke to the little girl. He touched her with the words, get up, you're all right, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna live a long life, you're gonna have 500 children, oh, we hope not. Can you imagine the diapers? Can you imagine the crying? Little girl, get up, you're okay. Let's get on with your life. You see, touch is essential to life. It's essential to well-being. Frederick the Great of Prussia ordered an experiment, believing that newborns spoke the language of the Garden of Eden until they learned the contemporary language that their parents were speaking, upon which they forgot the language of Eden. So he ordered orphans to be taken to this special place and be supervised by caretakers who were strictly instructed not to speak to the children, not to say a word in their presence, not to touch them, not to pick them up, just to leave them there and feed them. No touching allowed. Can you believe that all the children in this experiment died before they were of the age when the brain has developed to the point where language begins to be a possibility, and they begin to say their first words. All the children died without being held. 
All the children died without being spoken to. The combination of which is the primo touch that gives the child a sense of well-being and belonging and being calmed. Could it be, could it be that touching by speech or by hand is something Jesus wants to you and I to do to validate others? Others who don't seem to be getting close to other people, they're holding off, they're in the corner, they're sitting alone, there's nobody near them for 10 pews. Could it be that Jesus wants us to touch people and pronounce by that touch that that person is included in God's family, that that person matters to God, that God wants to hold that person when they are hurting or scared or alone, that God wants to soothe that person with his words, hopefully memorized from scripture, which would be implanted in their heads at that moment, that would soothe them and calm them and let them know that they were cared for. Could it be that you and I are not only capable of that, but expected to do that? The woman with the flow of blood and the father with the dying child reached out to touch Jesus by the father by speech, the woman by making contact with his robe. And Jesus in return reached back with words that made everything all right, that healed the woman, that raised the child from the dead. They reached out in faith. They heard with the expectation of the words of scripture, the words that have been quoted from God. Not based on expecting that if they believed enough, they get what they wanted from Jesus. Perhaps you know horror stories, in my opinion, that misrepresent our faith, of people who tell other people, well, if, if you just you know, kept the Ten Commandments better, if you attended church every Sunday, if you increased your pledge, then God will answer your prayers the way you want. But that's not how it works, folks. There's nothing you can do that puts God in your debt so that by your good behavior, your exceptional behavior, he owes you hearing and doing as you ask. No, believing in his love, believing in his forgiveness, believing in his companionship, that was trustworthy to see them through their lives, to know that he was with them. From brokenness to wholeness, with a touch, a word. Isn't that our ministry too? Instead of that look we give people when we're sending the message, don't get close to me, I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to touch you, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Go take a bath, go get a job. From brokenness to wholeness, isn't that our ministry too? Faith in God's desire to forgive is the touch that transforms sickness to health. And many people who are sick, not all, certainly, are making themselves sick because they know they have let God down and they haven't said or done anything about it. Just regret until the next pleasure comes along to take your mind off it. Alcohol, overeating, 
other things that don't need to be mentioned. According to Mark chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, the woman with the flow of blood had heard about Jesus and came behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. And in hope said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Because if he can't do it, nobody can. If he can't heal me, nobody can. If he can't raise me from the dead, nobody can. Well, daughter, he healed you. Little girl, he raised you. Isn't that what we're Isn't that what was we're supposed to do? It should be obvious that I think it is. If I may take a moment of personal privilege, I don't want you to be worried about my slurred speech at times as if I have been drinking communion wine prior to coming to the pulpit. What's going on is I have an entire denture on my lower jaw and I have yet to find the right glue and the right amount to either hold it there so it doesn't jump around on my jaw or uh, ooze out the side and get on the tip of my tongue and the inside of my lips like it is right now. 
So, I'm sober. <laughs> Folks, we are grateful to have you worship with us on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost. And we truly hope you can be stewardship partners with us in our ministry, both here and around the world, in the same way that you've been partners in our worship. If you are able and willing, please consider mailing an offering to our church office this week. That's at 51 West Blackwell Street in Dover, 07801. In preparation for those offerings being made and received, let us pray. Most holy God, who hears our prayers and answers them and gives us more than we can ask or imagine, accept this week's offerings and use them to your glory, that even now we might imitate your coming reign of justice, peace, and love for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Kiddos? Or just one kiddo. <laughs> okay. Sorry, that was my fault. I needed to turn it on. Okay. Um, real quick, some announcements. On August 21st, we will be having a one-day vacation Bible school for the Sunday school kids. Uh, more to follow on that. On, the, on August 29th, we will be doing the blessing of the backpacks. So we're inviting all kids to bring their backpacks to church with them so they can be blessed for an amazing school year. On September 12th, we will be having our church picnic at Hedden Park. And on September 19th, Sunday school will begin again. Um, now, joys and concerns. Prayers for everyone in Surfside and their families who are still waiting to hear back. Uh, about their loved ones. Prayers for the individuals that have had COVID-19 and the people that are having residual effects. Prayers for rain for all those suffering from drought. Prayers for individuals to listen to one another and to learn to work together to make the world a better place. Uh, Kim is asking for strength and energy. And we want to say a huge congratulations to Linda Sperry on her retirement this week from the Dover School System. She will be extremely missed, especially by me. Um, <laughs> our individual prayers for the week are for Ayana, Angel, Dawn, Danielle, Lily, Bruce, Jody, Gina, Donna, Tony, Walter, Wayne, Diana, David, Eni, Israel, Jonathan, Karen, Kim, Keith, Larry, Nishabi, Joe, Nancy, Kyle, Barbara, Andrew, Jay, Jerry, Florence, Ellen, Richard, Christine, Eddie, Armando, Sarah, Dominic, Denise, Shayla, Joanne, Peter, Kathy, Ted, Mario, Rich, Gary, Helen, Catherine, Amanda, Athea, Naomi, Rick, John, Connor, and Linda. Will our usher please pass out the test papers that asks you to remember and write down all those names? We believe so, we pray. Most Holy Father, creator of time and eternity and everything else, you are Lord of every season which makes up our lives. And you see us through every one of them, whether walking by our side or carrying us because we are too weak to make it our own, leaving, as they say, just one set of footprints in the sand. You have been with us through child rearing, working, vacationing, homemaking, liberating wars, a pandemic, medical operations, and the regaining of health, to name but a few. We watch others endure great fires, very destructive wind and water, and every flavor of natural and human-made disasters. We pray for those people whose victims of heart-rending circumstances, which are often crippling loads to bear, that they may feel your presence and sense your touch. Certainly there are a myriad of such difficulties all around the world this very day. And we pray for these unfortunate folks as well. Yet we are still unprepared and emotionally overwhelmed 
When something like a 12-story condominium building collapses, that is to say, a very heavy concrete and steel building pancakes onto the landfill or the reclaimed land on which it was built. While most of the 159 residents were sound asleep, that story just really puts us in emotional overload, doesn't it? It does me. And again, we turn to you, O oh God, on behalf of those who appear lost and on behalf of their grieving families and friends, even while we thank you for the boy who was rescued. We turn to you on behalf of the millions of people whose lives are at risk for extreme heat in the Northwest. We turn to you on behalf of the millions of people who are barely subsisting in refugee camps around the world. On behalf of those whose lives are in danger because of their beliefs or because of their ethnicity due to ethnic cleansing. Father, in addition to such concerns as these, we pray on behalf of those who many of us pray for individually, in large part because they are not known to all of us. But if they matter to our partners in faith and our partners in ministry, they matter to us. We close for now thanking you for Jesus, who taught us when praying to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, go in peace, trusting even where you have not seen. And may God, our guardian, protect you, Christ the healer restore you, and the Holy Spirit sustain you this day and forevermore. Amen.